So for the past few weeks, I'm sure you've been enjoying the Olympics. Maybe you haven't been able to watch them during the day, but you can see the highlights at night and you get to find out how people did. And maybe you also look online during the day just to see who's doing what and how it's going. But for me, it's been a pure joy at the end of the day, usually around 10.30, 11 o'clock, Jeffrey and I watch the highlights and it's just such a great thing to be able to see and experience. But one of my favorite aspects about the Olympics is actually learning about the competitors. I like to find out how did they actually earn their way into this? What's the level of commitment that they've made? What are some of the obstacles they've overcome? And in many cases, they talk about the faith they had that carried them into this experience. Even in the races and the competition, the interviews afterwards often convey the amount of faith it takes to match the commitment. I'm going to share a few of my favorite stories with you. First is the one most talked about in the first week, which was gymnast Simone Biles. She overcame mental health challenges following the Tokyo Olympics. She showed up as the oldest competitor in the group. And with dozens of cameras following her around, she managed not only to perform, but to walk away with four medals, three of them gold. Another favorite of mine was Cole Hawker. He's a runner. And the best part of his 1500 meter event was Cole is running this race behind the leader who had won previously. And he is running and he's keeping up with them, but he notices there these two, the one who's been the champion and the one trying to beat him are so focused on each other, they don't see him coming. So he literally in that moment, and he shares this after in an interview, in that mo moment, he says to himself, let's meddle. And he said in that moment, that lane on the left side of the Norway runner opens up and he runs ahead and he said in the interview, I let God carry me. And then later he's trying not to be embarrassed by his faith. I don't know why people do that, but they do. So he tones it down and says, I guess you could call it a divine intervention. Runner Noah Lyles, I'm sure you've heard about him. People were trash talking that guy. Oh, he's so egotistical, he's so full of himself. Yeah, he's also full of medals. So, um, <laughs> you know, I think everybody should be as lucky as he is and, um, and not judge the man. But he lost in 2018 in the Tokyo Olympics. He came in third. Now, most of us wouldn't consider coming in third as a loss, but he said, I deserved it. I deserve to lose. It will never happen again. And in an interview, he said, that loss lit a humongous fire and ignited me. And since he said he's been training for the gold, and of course, he took the gold. He's taking the gold home. Gymnast Suni Lee. 2022, she's at Auburn U University. She just managed to get, after one and a half years in school, college there, she earned the Southeastern Conference Freshman of the Year, 10 All-America honors, an individual championship title on the balance beam. And then her body starts swelling up and she doesn't know why. She can't practice and she doesn't know what's going on and she gets diagnosed with two rare kidney disorders. And she doesn't wanna give up on her dream but she really can't do much. So she starts getting treatment, she had to quit college and in 2023 she posted this, I will not stop pursuing my dreams for a bit 
to Paris in 2024. That was one year prior she said that. And she won two gold, a silver and a bronze. And last story I'm going to share, it's definitely my favorite because I think this took immense perseverance, was pole vaulter Armand Duplantis, known as Mondo. He started pole vaulting at age three. By seven, he had set world records competing at the highest level. He was born to an American father who was a pole vaulter and a Swedish mother who competed as a long jumper. His dad, Greg, is his technical coach and his mom, Helena, is his trainer. He had set a world record before turning 16 and again at age 18. He wanted to compete in the U.S. Paris Olympics, but the U.S. told him, you cannot have two people as your coaches. You'll have to pick one. Well, he wasn't giving up either. So he decided to compete for Norway because he also has dual citizenship. So he, Norway says, come over here. We'll let you have both parents as your coaches. He did, and he broke the, his, not, his own ninth world record, winning the gold for Norway. He pole vaulted 20 feet 6 inches. Do you have any idea how tall that is? <laughs> and he made it over. But what I loved about his story is he said in the interview, this was my favorite line of the whole two weeks, he said, this has been my dream since I was three years old. And he was not willing to take no for an answer. Now, the reason I shared those stories is because for each of these people, it took six to eight hours a day of training for years, not knowing what this would lead to, not knowing if anything good could come from it. Just that severe commitment, perseverance, they were all, the most common theme among, amongst them was that their dreams were always greater than their obstacles and they never lose, lost sight of what they wanted. All of them were constantly under the watch of the media, but none of them allowed themselves to be distracted by it. All maintained faith in something unseen. Now imagine what each of us would be able to do in our own lives if we were to develop and channel an Olympic mindset. Six to eight hours every day, I want to get healthy. I'm affirming my health. Six to eight hours a day, I want a healthier relationship. Six to eight hours a day, I want a better job than the one I have. Whatever it is, six to eight hours a day, undying commitment, ignoring the naysayers, your critics, and the cynics. No, but what do we do? Well, I'll tell you what we do. We do 10 minutes of prayer a day and 10 hours negating how that can't be possible because there's this circumstance that I don't have this money, I don't have that on my resume, blah, 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 blah. But is it possible that we could have enough faith in ourselves and in our higher power and in that inner wisdom to be able to commit that amount of intense passion for something we wanted to accomplish and have enough faith that what we can't see does not mean it is not possible. Yes. Thank you, Sam. <laughs> Hallelujah. Yes. I truly believe we can learn from them. But we can also learn from the best unity example I know, and that's Myrtle Fillmore. Co-founder Myrtle Fillmore was raised with continued reminders that she was an invalid, that she had tuberculosis, she had inherited it, 
She was told it, she believed it, she contracted malaria and other illnesses because she knew she was an invalid and that's what happens to invalids. She stayed as active as she could. She became a teacher. She attended a local church. She even got married to Charles Fillmore. But she continued to struggle and battle with her health issues her entire life. Doctors finally told her, there is nothing else we can do for you. And you should move out of Kansas City to a place like Colorado where you would be healthier but otherwise you're gonna live a very short life. <coughs> but Charles didn't want to move to Colorado. He was willing, but the reason he hesitated is because Charles had had a dream. And in the dream he saw himself in Kansas following people. And in the dream he says, I heard a voice that said, follow me. And he was being led up and down hilly streets of Kansas City. And he didn't know what that dream meant, but he felt that he couldn't ignore it. Well, at the very same time he had that dream, she goes and sees a metaphysical new thought speaker called Dr. E.B. Weeks. And she goes to his lecture in Kansas City on new thought, Christian science, and divine science. And remember, this is 1880. So imagine how bizarre anybody thought it was to go to a divine science, new thought kind of lecture. But she went. In one hour, in one hour of listening to this man, her entire mindset changed about who she was. One hour. After that, and especially hearing this, that she was a beloved child of God and that God's will for her was nothing less than a perfect life and wholeness, filled her mind and started to possess her being. That tired old belief that she was born to be an invalid was quickly released and she left that lecture with a new realization, not only in her mind, but present in herself, in her soul, in her body. She began continually reciting every single chance she got, I am a child of God, and therefore I do not inherit sickness. Myrtle said this, and I'm going to read you her words because they're going to be far better than mine. I have made what seems to me a discovery. I was fearfully sick. I had all the ills of mind and body I could bear. Medicine and doctors ceased to give me relief, and I was in despair when I found practical Christianity. I took it up, and I was healed. I did most of the healing myself because I wanted to understand this for future use. Life, she said, is simply a form of energy, and it has to be guided and directed in our body by our intelligence. How do we communicate intelligence? By how we think and speak. So everything that goes on in our head is told to our body. And a lot of people say to me, well, you know, I was born this way. Well, nobody was given that destiny. Our minds control how far we take our destiny. Our minds are what decide whether we're gonna feel good today or bad. Our minds decide, is this doable at my age? Or, oh, you better not even try and don't tell anybody because they'll discourage you. She said, then it flashed upon me that I might talk to the life in every part of my body and have, to do, have it do just what I want. I began to teach my body. I got marvelous results. And here's what she did. Every hour for two years, two years, she sent out a prayer reinforcing her connection to spirit and apologized for any thoughts she held in her body that were not powerful. 
She spoke to the life energy in her liver, saying it was not underperforming anymore and that it was full of vigor and energy. She told the life energy in her stomach it was not weak or inefficient, but energetic, strong, and intelligent, that it was no longer infested with thoughts of disease, but pure, wholesome energy of God. She told her limbs they were active and strong and literally walked through every part of her day, body every single day affirming her health speaking words of truth to them, asking for forgiveness for having called them weak her entire life. Most importantly, she did not become discouraged at any time, and she did not listen to the doubters. Within two years, Myrtle was no longer an invalid. Through her prayers, she was made whole. Her story is a reminder for all of us that our efforts are a direct result of how much time our mind and our chatter is going on hurting us. How many of you talk trash about yourself or to yourself every day? Come on. You say something like, oh, that was a stupid move, or I shouldn't have done that, or oh, geez, why, why did I do that? Okay, none of that helps us feel better about ourselves, just so we're clear. You know, or this is a bad hair day. Trust me, it doesn't get better. As the day goes on, once it's a bad hair day, it's a bad hair day, okay? So either get over it or get someone like I did this morning to help you. <laughs> Thank you, Mari. So... If we think about these Olympians, we think about Myrtle Fillmore, then we can learn not only from their examples, but the importance of never giving up. An Olympic mindset says, you see it, you believe it, and you're open to receiving it. Let's review our lessons for today. Channeling an Olympic mindset can empower us if we are willing to first commit to achieving our highest good. How badly do you want it? Affirm it, see it, believe it, receive it. Number two, take daily steps toward the desired outcome. It is a marathon, not a sprint. Stay diligent. I actually once read that Jesus understood prayer was a marathon, not a sprint. That it was a long effort. It is not a moment by moment thing. Number three, acknowledge all signs of progress. When you start making progress, don't be unhappy about what you didn't get done. Be happy about what you did get done. That's the worst part of trying to achieve something. Oh, I didn't do it that well. Oh, geez, I'm not as good as I should be. Don't do that. Find the good in what you did. Because otherwise, you're looking for people to tell you that. And we all know not everyone's going to tell us the good about ourselves. Be proud. Express gratitude and confidence that this, too, can be achieved. Number four, trust your inner voice, not your critics. See beyond circumstances and obstacles. The affirmation I created for today was, I am channeling an Olympic mindset. Let's say that together. I am channeling an Olympic mindset. And from Katie Ledecky herself, the swimmer, I would encourage you to set really high goals. Set goals that when you set them, you think they're impossible. But then every day you can work towards them and anything is possible. So keep working hard and follow your dreams. Let's take that in. So we pause now to reflect upon the importance of channeling an Olympic mindset on remembering that all things are possible through our faith and our willingness to train the human mind 
not to think it's God's responsibility to provide, but to train the human mind and see divine spirit as a resource of what we are channeling. Nothing will come to us if we don't have the intention first. We must set the intention, make the commitment, hold and affirm through prayer that this shall be my highest good. This or something better is always the phrase to use. This or something better. And so we say, thank you, God. Amen.